Well, the conversation about gender in America has expanded in recent years. There's a wealth of knowledge on the idea that there's more than two genders out there. Many kids are accepting themselves as different genders earlier in life, and schools are also adapting. For example, a Missouri school district has installed gender-neutral bathrooms in several of its schools. North Kansas City put them in the high school, two new elementary schools, and two sixth-grade centers. Stalls are enclosed with floor-to-ceiling walls and lockable doors. Students will share a trough sink in the common area. The district first tried the design in 2016. But this look into gender isn't just happening with older kids. A lot of parents are now allowing their children to pick their gender for themselves, basically leaving them without a label until they're old enough to choose. So we wanted to see how this concept works and how the idea translates to kids in the classroom. Now for this piece, it's important to note sex and gender are not interchangeable terms. Sex is how you were born physically, but gender is how you identify socially. Okay, let's do this. Push. Having a baby is hard enough. Get out! Ten fingers and toes arrive and rock your whole world. Some parents have everything ready months in advance. Others barely make it to the hospital. Some already have a name picked out, while others decide to go with the flow. But a new wave of parenting is on the horizon. Some call it gender-neutral parenting, or there's gender-creative and gender-diverse. They all mean whatever that sex box on the birth certificate says is irrelevant because these parents want their kids to decide for themselves who they're going to be and what gender they're going to be. Licensed social worker Israel Martinez told website The Cut that gender norms can be too limiting. He suggests the freedom to explore who they are will promote health and happiness. Until the child can choose, the parents refer to the child with they or them pronouns. Some are calling them babies. Parents.com says there are varying degrees of this parenting style. It references a Toronto couple who still hasn't identified their three-year-old, but also a lesser form where parents encourage kids to play with stereotypically boy and girl toys, keep the colors neutral, and let them wear whatever clothes they're comfortable in. You can switch genders and go to a girl if you're a boy. Expert opinions of this vary. Some say it allows kids to develop without society forcing its own ideas, while others worry it can be damaging. Some ask if this leaves children confused about who they are or are not. A study published by the American Academy of Pediatrics looked into the risks children who are non-gender conforming face. It found more often than not, children not conforming to a gender was an indicator of increased risk of abuse or lifetime PTSD. Meanwhile, one doctor told The Cut, raising kids without a gender is almost impossible once you send them to school or daycare. Families shared a variety of positive and negative experiences with the publication. Completely aware of these risks, the Human Rights Campaign has already created a solution. It's called Welcoming Schools. It's a professional development program that provides resources to schools, enabling them to create a welcoming environment to a diverse group of families. That includes families with gender non-conforming kids. It published research proving acceptance at school makes for a happier, more successful child. It says one-sixth of the students who identify with a gender opposite from the one they were physically assigned stopped going to school because of harassment. It also says schools that don't tolerate gender harassment report less bullying. A sociologist wrote in The Atlantic that this movement of gender identity awareness is an intense cultural moment. You can find an expert, doctor, or friend that supports this movement just as easily as you can find someone who doesn't. What's clear across disciplines is there's not enough research to prove if this parenting style leads to healthier, happier kids. We'll just have to wait for this new generation of babies to grow up and tell us what happens next. So what's important to note about this is obviously, as I said in there, how new it is. So we mm -hmm. don't really know how this goes. But what I thought was interesting was this could all be derailed once you send your kids to school if the teachers and the staff aren't supportive of what you're trying to do. Because right. think about how much you learned about socializing in school with other kids. So well, in the parallels I saw in there, like just associating to my own life uh, in terms of sexuality and gender identity, two very different things. Mm -hmm. uh, but the mention of being like, well, if you do allow your child to identify with their appropriate gender, then could come adverse reactions from other people which right. you can't control, which right. kind of then almost wants you to like protect your child. That's yeah. how you view it, by limiting their scope mm -hmm. of what they view and how they identify. 
um, which is, again, its own other beast. As if parenting wasn't terrifying right. enough. So right. lots of conversations have to happen there. So while we did our own research, we wanted to go to an expert for more about this growing trend in parenting. We grabbed Dr. Lise Elliott for that. She's the author of the book Pink Brain, Blue Brain, which examines how gender stereotypes can actually be harmful to a child. Uh, Dr. Okay. Elliott, thank you so much for joining us on the day ahead this morning. Uh, of course, we're talking about gender and raising children. Um, so how much of gender can influence a child's development? Well, uh, it's huge. I mean, um, gender is sort of the first thing we pay any attention to about a child. Uh, we use different pronouns. We basically treat boys and girls kind of like different species. And so just like we treat our cats and dogs differently, um, being a boy or being a girl is a very different experience. And just like cats and dogs have genetic and hormonal differences, boys and girls also have these differences. So it's really a blend of nature and nurture that makes the experience of being a boy or being a girl uh, essentially an entirely different culture. So research shows that constant bombardment of these female, male stereotypes on a child could be harmful to a kid, uh, but could there be drawback from not doing it at all? Yeah, well, you know, gender, as I said, is a part of culture. And so if you are in a culture where gender roles are very established and, and gender identity is very important, and I think you could argue that every culture is like that, there's really nowhere on earth where there's a gender-free society, that uh, parents who are trying to raise their children so-called gender-free um, are up against a, a pretty high hurdle in uh, helping them adapt to you know the surrounding world. At the same time, I think unless we do start to challenge some of these uh, stereotypes and expectations, we're really going to continue to limit the possibilities for boys and girls, both you know in the career realm as well as the interpersonal realm. Is, and that challenge that you talk about, is there any research out there yet that kind of talks about raising your child without those gender stereotypes? You know, there's not good research on raising children gender free because as I said, it's extremely rare. It's just not done. Um, we do know what happens if you take a genetic boy and raise him as a girl, which people aren't doing as freak experiments, but happen certain, in certain situations for medical reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. If the um, genitalia are ambiguous at birth, and in the olden days, the only way to uh, surgically correct for malformed genitalia was it was typically easier to create a female body than a male body. So we do have a cohort of genetic males who were raised as females. And generally speaking, if you so-called reassign a child at birth, they adapt to the gender of the rearing. So, you know, call a child a girl and give her a female pronoun and she will self-identify as a girl. Um, so we do huh. think that by and large, gender identity is strongly shaped by culture and uh, s socialization, not 100%, but it, socialization plays a very strong role. I mean, that said, that's still taking in the binary and assuming you know boys and girls will be raised as one or the other. This idea of a gender-free society where we don't use pronouns and we, we don't pay attention any more to a child's genitalia than we do to, you know, there are other parts of the anatomy uh, has only been done in a few families and a few parts of the of the Western world. And by and large, these kids seem to be doing just fine. Uh, there doesn't seem to be major psychological harm. And you could argue that they do have a broader spectrum of interests and, uh, and abilities. Now, it's one thing to hear about it from a doctor, but what about a family that has actually gone through it? I chatted with Tiffany Cook, who is doing just that. Why did you decide to make the decision about um, not assigning your baby gray a gender? That's a really great question. Um, so just to give a little bit of background of myself, I am a queer woman and I work in LGBTQ health primarily. And you know, in the world of LGBT health, we talk a lot about how sex and gender are separate constructs. The sex that is assigned at birth is not necessarily the gender that somebody identifies with later in life. And it felt kind of disingenuous to me to assign my kid a sex when 
the reality is, is that they may or may not identify that when they're older. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was kind of our, our, our big kind of sticking point when I was talking about it with my partner. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we decided that it made a lot of sense to instead use they, them pronouns to expose our child to all genders and all expression options and for them to be able to kind of navigate what felt best for them. And you said that Gray will get to choose when they're ready. What do you have like in your mind an age or like when you think that may happen? Yeah, I mean, I, so from what we know about gender and kind of gender development, we know that it's usually somewhere in the like three-year-old range that oh, wow. kids wow. start to kind of play with gender. They don't necessarily identify with one gender or another. They start to kind of figure out that gender is a thing and they start talking about boys and girls, they start talking about like different types of clothing, but they don't always ascribe the idea or concept of being a boy or a girl to themselves. And so that's kind of the time that we expect Gray will start to play. Um, when Gray starts asking us about pronouns and they they want to try on she or her or he or him, like we're absolutely comfortable with them trying those on. And if that changes daily, that's okay too. Um, I think that that's one of the things that is really hard for people to kind of come to grips with is this idea that pronouns and identity can be a little bit fluid as kids are figuring them out. But that's very real. I remember when my niece was three and she would jump around on the couch without a shirt on and she would just kind of be like, yeah, I'm a boy right now. You know, and I'm like, cool, great, be a boy right now. And like, that's totally fine. I think that we forget that kids have a lot of like time to kind of develop and play with their expression and their ideas of who they are and what they want to be. Um, And sadly, our society dictates to them what that should look like. And so a lot of my work, I think theoretically, looks at how could we reshape our culture and our society to actually include everybody so that way we don't have so much stigma or shame for the people who don't quite fit into what society expects. And do you worry about when Gray gets older and has this like forward thinking perspective of life and gender and sex, do you worry about how other people will perceive that or how they'll be able to navigate that in social situations? I mean, I think there are some parts that are hard. Um, I'm in this group on Facebook full of people who are using they, them pronouns for their kids. And one of the parents said, sometimes I feel like I'm setting my kid up because when you walk in to try to use a bathroom, there's not an all gender bathroom usually. There's usually like men's and women's rooms. Um, And I think what that means for us is that it means that we're going to be having really deep conversations with kids who are three to five years old. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a great time developmentally to be talking about these things. Love that she was so open and totally Mm -hmm. appreciate that because people that do this do not have to be open about it. It's not our business. But it's important to be. I think when you start talking about, you know, societal concepts and how to change, you know, the status quo of what things are. It starts with that small conversation. And I think another part of it is like, we have to ask questions that I think maybe sometimes feel insensitive or very personal, Um, but it's just, it really does come out of a place of ignorance and just not knowing. Yeah, and I think in my research, what I found was really interesting was some doctor was like, you can't do this just to prove a point or just to take a societal stand Mm -hmm. against gender norms. You have to do it because you think it's what's best for your kid or your family. And she was talking about how both her and her partner were negatively affected Mm -hmm. by gender norms and thought that this would be best that their child wouldn't have to go through that. And that's extremely important when you do something like this. And hard to do as a parent to figure out what's best for your kid because maybe what would have been better for you may not be best for them. It's, I mean, essentially it's all a gamble. Absolutely. So is parenting though. Yeah, so is parenting. Oh my God.